good to see you all. Just on ten past, I think we, we, we may start. Was anyone else just in Howell Roberts just then? Yeah, yeah, yeah just had to reapply my lipine on mascara. <laughs> Somehow managed to get ink all over me as well. I can't blame him on that. But I can, yeah. Anyway, great to see you all this afternoon. So I'm going to be running through <coughs> some of the thinking around high challenge, low threat, the implications for us as professionals as we hold ourselves to account and um, our colleagues to account and the implications for this work for uh, our, some of our classroom practice. So I'm going to start, first of all, uh, with a thought experiment. So just imagining that uh, we're going to be sitting a test, all of us, like in the next three minutes. So no time to prepare. Um, don't know what it's going to be. And through the magic of the internet, it's going to be marked and uh, we're going to be ranked and put in place order according to how well we've come in the test. So it's going to be very obvious who the top bunnies are and who might be struggling um, at the back. So can we just pause for a moment and have a think about how that imaginary test would make us feel? I love holding a silence. <laughs> Okay, could you just uh, turn to someone near you and just, there's no right or wrong, just some responses to that. High stakes, check, test. any responses. Can anyone tell me why you fell silent? What happened? You were thinking, then you were talking, then you stopped talking. Sorry? I asked you, you all felt fallen silent. It's so interesting. It doesn't matter what the size of the group is, Everyone falls silent, and they've no idea what I said. That's so interesting. So it's, I'm not having a go anyone, I just find it really interesting. What I said was, because <laughs> you, you're all doing this, I'm constituted. What I said was, when you're ready. All I said was, when you're ready. Now, the reason I'm making just a bit of this is because I'm in a lot of classrooms where the teacher sets up something really quite interesting to do, to think about, Children are talking, and what happens is it's stop talking now. And woe betide anyone who carries on talking because they are challenging my authority as a teacher. Now, I think we've got to do a bit of thinking around this, and that is that as a child's thoughts and ideas, and us as adults, our ideas come out, that is when the learning is going on. And my self-esteem as an educator should not trump children's learning. They do become quiet. You became quiet. Occasionally, I have to say it more than once. That is OK. So I just think it's quite interesting. You all need to be quiet, but nobody knew what I'd said. <coughs> interesting going on there, because you all had the chance to finish what you were saying. OK, metacognitive uh, direction, they're over. A anybody like to say how that, what their response was to that? High stakes. Highly visible test. What was going on there? Anxious. 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 <coughs> anxious. Worried. Uh, you're immediately in competition. You're anxious about the people who are around you. So in terms of groups, it's destroyed that. Yeah. So very highly visible about how you're going to compare with others around you. Anybody else? Yeah, absolutely. Oh gosh, right. Sorry. It wasn't. It was. It wasn't for real. <laughs> okay. But it isn't. Okay. Anyone feel... Oh, do you, would you like to add to that? If you felt you might not do well at the test, then you might feel really angry at it and think it was pointless anyway. Yeah. Did anyone uh, think the opposite? Was 
which is fine because there's no judgmental bit there. Yeah, would you like to say? Thank you. I think it would bother me if a couple of us mulled it up now to think that that's yeah. going to make any difference to who I am. Yeah. Okay. okay, so that's really interesting. So there's a small minority, well, I've done this for thousands of times in the last 15 months or so when I've been thinking hard about this. About 90% of people express what you, um, the handful of people said, very uncomfortable, very nervous, the higher cognitive functioning elements of our capacity to do well or shut down because of all the emotions that are going on. About 10% of people in my non-scientific study express either what you do, the they're okay with it. And a handful of people actually get a bit of an adrenaline rush because they're quite excited about it. But for most of us, it's a pretty uncomfortable space to be. This high stakes, highly visible, high challenge, high threat. Yet, how many of us, either on our own count or know people at home or friends who are doing things like crosswords, Sudoku puzzles, word puzzles uh, in their own time? Do, do, any, do you know anyone who does that? Just one a few, not two months? Yeah. So there's something very interesting going on, that we're prepared to put ourselves under pressure, to test ourselves, and test ourselves, and go back and do it again. And then once we've got to a certain level, we don't normally like going back to do the easy examples again. We're prepared to do that in our own time. And not only that, we've got companies that are making millions of pounds out of the fact that we like testing ourselves. You go into any supermarket, you go to any news agents, there's going to be yards of this stuff. They don't put it out there unless they're making money. So we've got a situation where, under the right conditions, we are prepared to put ourselves under pressure, to go back and do things again, to go on to more demanding stuff, as long as there's nobody making us feel like a muppet. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but when I've done this before, I don't think I'm the only person who's been made to feel like a muppet publicly. And, oh, and privately. And sometimes it's unintentional. It's like, oh, you could have done better, you're stupid. Sometimes it's intentional, and that's really not wrong. We've got to be very, very careful about um, how, we, how we talk about this. But what I'm arguing from this is that we are a challenge-seeking species. We like doing things that are difficult. We like putting ourselves under pressure, as long as there's nobody making us feel foolish. And what we need to be doing as part of that is to be distinguishing the work from the person. So I can be very robust about the work as long as I leave the humanity of the person that I'm talking with um, intact. When we start doing that, we can start really, really pushing ourselves and also pushing other people, including our children. So what is it that our students and pupils are saying? What is it that they are saying? Well, they're telling me that they want more demanding work. So I'm doing a lot of student voice. I've done a lot of student voice over the last 15 years or so. Um, not asking students whether they like me or any other teacher. Not asking them about whether they like their you know, um, patterns on their socks or anything like that. But talking about what quality provision looks like and what might, what might improve it. And some very, very interesting stuff comes out, and I think it's um, a big strand of work that has been debased somehow. There's a huge amount of information, valuable information in there. So I was doing some of this work in, um, in a London school in the Christmas term, in the autumn term. And I was asked to work with, uh, for part of this, was to work with some students that um, the school had identified as being um, highly, um, highly able but um, were mucking about, basically. Um, able but idle, basically, you know. We've all, we've all got those in our, in, our, in our settings, haven't they? So when I was talking to these students, they happened to be boys and in year nine, and I said to them, what is it that's happening? Is it happening in any lesson where you are not mucking about, where you are really throwing yourself into the work? And if so, what is it? And in this school, it happened to be geography. So I said to them, what is it that's happening in geography then? And they said, well, for homework, our teacher sets us articles that would normally be read by um, university students. It's a geographical association type of uh, level, undergraduate and some postgraduate level. 
And what we have to do is we have to read those. We don't understand it all, but that's okay. High challenge, low threat. And we come back at the start of the next lesson and we talk about what we found interesting and what we didn't understand. They were crying out for this work. And in the uh, subsequent time that I've been talking about this, there have been a lot of examples of people coming back saying, we've tried this, giving them more demanding work, and they're absolutely lacking, absolutely lacking it out. Um, and it was interesting that, that, now what I find interesting about that is that that took no time apart from researching some articles, printing them off or giving them the link in terms of preparation and homework marking. You know, really, really robust, rich stuff, which did not mean that it was extra work for teacher. It was about thinking more strategically about what children were um, after. Some of you will have seen this on, on the Twitter. I just put it up there to symbolise. I'm going to just you know, read the headlines of it very quickly. But as some Peacock's work um, in assessment for learning without levels, as part of that, <laughs> in one of the chapters, they interviewed uh, pupils year five going into year six. Um, doing some people voice around that. What they said, the high prior retaining children said that they enjoyed having difficult demanding work, they enjoyed doing challenges. The middle grouping of children said that they liked the sound of some of the challenges, but they'd worked out that they were never going to get to do them because there were only six seats on the top table. Um, and then the low prior retaining children um, were desperately keen to do some, but they knew that they would never ever get the chance. So there's something going on where interesting, demanding work is um, deeply uh, uh, wanted and needed by children, and somehow we're doing something to systematise giving them stuff that's watered down and too easy. They can rise above it and do more. That's what they're asking for. In um, uh, Gordon Stobart's work out of the Institute of Education came out about three years or so ago. Um, he talks about um, how his work has shown, this is the expert learner, great resource, he has shown that 88% of children placed in ability setting at the age of four, 88% of them are still in those bandings by the time they leave school. I think we've got some really big questions to be asking about that. Um, if I ran education, I'd ban the use of the term ability. <coughs> All we can reasonably say is prior attainment. So we've got low, middle, and high prior attaining pupils and students. How dare I say what someone is capable of in the future? Um, and the consequences of that, of streaming, setting, top tables, and all the rest of it, uh, I, I, think, I think we are <coughs> we seriously got to ask some questions around that. So just in terms of teaching and learning and, and how we might unpack a bit of this, what I'm arguing is, is that we should be thinking about high <coughs> demanding stuff as an entitlement for every child. We prepare for the top and we unpack it through talk. Talk and support are the most powerful forms of differentiation. Differentiation is a stupid word anyway. Why would, I make things, <laughs> why would I make things different? Give them some really rich demonic stuff and talk it through. Okay. Um, I need to know whether the students and pupils have mastered something. You know, have they got to the greater depths of, of this rich stuff? And so teaching to depth in every classroom. We need to be thinking about why it is good for our students and pupils to get stuck. Right? If I'm going to offer difficult, demanding stuff which is going to stretch them, it must follow from that that they're not going to get it straight away. So this is a place of psychological uncertainty for me as a teacher and for my pupils and students as well. That's okay. If I'm going to set up something which has got some cognitive conflict in there, that is going to be a natural <coughs> consequence. And we need to be celebrating the fact that students and pupils get stuck and it's a good thing. If you think logically, if they all came to school and knew everything that I got to teach them, I'd have a job. So it's quite important they come to school not knowing stuff. Linked to this is I don't think it's always helpful to be protecting children's self-esteem. And increasingly the work has shown that. I, um, fab, brilliant, well done, marvellous. 
fantastic. Yeah, but it wasn't really. And the teacher knows that, and the kid knows that. So there's a kind of dishonesty going on there. And, it's, and there are people aren't being deliberately dishonest. It's like, I've got to close this bit down so I can get on to the next bit of the content. Wrong way around. So I'm going to say something is fantastic. A bit trite, but anyway. I'm going to have to do a reason why. Or I might put it under pressure on you and say, Jules, why do you think I'm praising that work? Putting a cognitive load onto the child rather than signing off. And don't get me started on I like it. It's irrelevant if I like it or not. I like that you have done this. It's irrelevant. Was it any good? <laughs> so um, can we chop some cheap praise, please? It's, not, it's really not, um, not, not pushing the agenda on. I was talking about this with some secondary heads uh, this week. Um, and um, one of them said, um, head of a, a special school, um, um, Mostly, uh, mostly relating to behaviour, not completely behaviour. They said in the last 18 months, they have insisted that feedback is stripped back, is separated from praise. They will not give both. And I said, well, what is the impact of that? And she said, we've, we've pretty much eradicated learned helplessness. Right? They so will praise for effort over time, but they're giving feedback stripped back. That. They've, they've got that, they've understood. Some of our most demanding, some of our most vulnerable and, uh, children who need a huge amount, it's, it's not helpful. Let's be thinking about unpacking some big ideas and big concepts. The national curriculum is <coughs> chock full of concepts and big ideas, chock full of them. And somehow we get into the nitty gritty and start gobbertizing a curriculum into tiny little parts and ideally downloading some resources from <coughs> somewhere else. I'm, I'm not saying you here, I'm saying as a community that is quite often what's happening. Thinking through instead what are the big ideas and big concepts that are underpinning this and that I'm going to give my children access to. And linked to this is the notion that as I set tasks, the critical thing is the understanding, right? Because there's an awful lot of tasks that are getting completed, signed <laughs> off, <coughs> filling in a spreadsheet, I sit down to a child, they've got no blimmin' idea because they've not understood it, okay? But there's a proxy, there's a lot of proxies for learning going on of which the completion of tasks um, is one. So let's just unpack some thinkers um, who've done some work around this. Some of them are controversial, obviously only nick the bits that support my cause, but that's okay. <laughs> um, Carol Dweck's work, which a lot of you are familiar with around resilience, growth mindsets, etc. That thought experiment I did right at the beginning, um, that was her experience when she was at school, that um, there was a test, uh, exam test at, at the end of each week, and you came back on Monday morning, and you sat in order according to how you come from the rest of the week. She was always in the top four or five, but she wondered what was it like for the uh, children at the back, and her work <coughs> in terms of um, cognitive science psychology has been informed by that over the last 20 years or so. Um, Daniel Willingham's work on in terms of why don't students like school, odd title, but some quite interesting stuff in there. Another cognitive scientist from um, Virginia, professor in Virginia, but what impresses me about Willingham, Willingham and um, a number of the other cognitive scientists working in this field is that they're coming from a place of humility. They're talking about uh, <coughs> this is what the research is saying at the moment, and these are some possible implications for learning, and then they're triangulating that with, with the learning. It's not cast down, this is how you've got to do it. Um, but similarly, it's, it's quite hard for us to contest some of them if we don't agree with them. But Willingham argues that humans are curious, but thinking is hard. And I would argue that the thinking being hard is a bit like when we're working out. It's good, hard. It's sweet sweat that emerges from that. That we should be thinking about the... Um, offering a lot of the curriculum in terms of problems to be solved, problems to be solved. Um, seen some really strong work on this, for instance, in maths and in science, where students come in and at the start of the lesson, it's two contrasting answers to a question, right? And they've just got to work out which one is the correct one and why, right? Now, the great thing there is it doesn't matter if they've got the wrong one because it's through the talk that we unpack why it's the other one, not that one. Some lovely stuff um, in maths and uh, science that I've seen there. Um, a lot of work around the difference between long-term memory and working memory, that we need to be providing opportunities 
for our children to have a big bank of stuff that, is, that resides in the long-term memory that sh which can be drawn on, because our working memory can only hold so much. So if I'm still struggling with my times tables, if I haven't got, um, if I haven't really, really understood place value, and a teacher asks me to write down 102, I'm going to write down 1,002. Okay, I'm going to start drawing on all sorts of stuff that is going to clutter my head because I haven't got that deep. So we've got an obligation to our children to make this as rich and as deep as, and as possible, which leads to the next bit. Power of stories, conflicts, and dilemmas, which is why the themes that are in Coronation Street, EastEnders, and The Archers, which is my particular fix, these are ancient stories, okay, and they keep us, they keep us on our toes wondering what is going to be happening next. And then the meaning of the material. Now, I've got into trouble before about talking about how it's really important our children know what, why they're doing something. Is there some kind of existential uh, problem that I'm solving? No, well, we're doing this because. <laughs> and then I don't get students when I'm talking to them in second, some secondary context, and we're talking about uh, maths quite often comes up as an area where they're less um, secure, or they're not particularly enjoying it, which is a great shame. Maths is fabulous. And the topic, the area that comes up most often is algebra. And I say to them, well, why, why are you doing algebra? And a great many of them do not know why they are doing algebra. Those I've asked, are those I said, well, if you don't know, um, have you asked a teacher? Okay, and the response quite often is from the teacher is either I don't know, or for the exam, um, it's not, I don't think that's good enough. I don't think doing something for an exam, important as they are, is good enough. Right? So where does the term algebra come from? Who was Al-Ghazali? Where, where were these uh, methods first used? I do not need to be an historian of mathematics in order to start offering that to my children. I just ask those questions and say, who would like to find out? Code for homework. They come back and tell us. Okay, so the meaning of the material, we're doing this because... Right. So I'm not sitting next to a child. I don't want to hammer maths. I've just finished lots of maths lessons recently. Year nine, a few weeks or so ago, 20 minutes into a lesson on uh, proportion and proportionality. Half the page done, all neatly done out. Can I say, can you just tell me what it is you're doing and why and what proportionality means? No idea. We should have lost in the back in the book. That's all right. Okay. No one had spent two minutes saying the meaning of the material. Peter Brown and making it stick. Okay, spaced repetition, going back and doing things again. Interleaving of different but related topics. Okay, so we're going to do demanding stuff. We've got to come back and draw some threads together. It should be effortful. And the paradox of um, regular testing, low stakes testing, um, appears to be having um, a great uh, deal of benefit in terms of long-term memory, also pride in terms of, <coughs> this is where I was a few weeks ago, and this is where I am now. Dylan William, um, St. Dylan, responded to a blog post um, a couple of months or so ago on testing, and he said at the moment it appears as though the, um, the greatest effect, the, the biggest impact is when there are regular tests which are self-marked by the students and pupils, private to them, but they get them on a regular basis, the same stuff, and then they can see over time. It appears to be a paradox of forgetting. Right, so we're teaching demanding stuff, it's quite important that it gets forgotten and it's in the memory of trying to bring it back that the learning goes deep, but scary stuff. Leave that last one. Doug and Rob teach like a champion. Uh, absolute Marmite character, but some of his stuff is extremely interesting. Um, he says, no opt-out. If I'm teaching some demanding stuff about which I have absolute conviction, I do expect everybody to be with me. Right? I should be able to ask anyone at any point in the lesson for a response. Yeah, that should be an expectation. And if they don't know, I'll come. So here, I'll come back. Right. Now I'm mean. I'm yeah. I'm, I'm I'm tough, and I'm robust, but I'm not mean. So there'll always be someone in my class. Not always, but there could be someone in my class whose grandparent died the other day, whose cat got run over. So I won't call on them. All right, but I will expect them to be psychologically with us as well. No half answers. No half answers. Okay. Um, we would ramp up standards very, very quickly if we expected all our pupils, all our children, to answer in complete sense sentences using the correct grammar. And one of the reasons why we accept partial answers 
is for speed and we don't want to put our kids under pressure. They have an entitlement to this. Stretching the answer, so someone gives an answer and then it's a proxy, everybody else has got it right, you know? So if someone's given an answer, that's A, some lovely work being done by uh, Alex Quigley, uh, who was doing a session this morning, a few years ago. B, C, so someone, I'm going to ask someone for a because, okay, C, either contradictory or another contribution, stretching the answers so that we're making this, this work go further. Um, no cheap praise, great, and mistakes are good, celebrating mistakes. Ron Berger's work, The Ethic of Excellence, what a great title. Um, education isn't broken. Need to, I think we need to uh, remind ourselves of this. Education is not broken. <laughs> no, it feels like it. My, my, parents, my parents met in the early 50s in, in the East End of London. Father in the secondary, my mother in the primary bit. There were children then who took it in turns to go to school, according to who had the shoes that day. Now, we have still got levels of, of poverty, and we've seen the expression of some of that through pitiful images this week. However, not just materially, okay, but beyond that, I think we're in a much healthier space than we were even 20, 30 years ago. Um, good schools are creating a culture of excellence rather than perfection. Perfection is a completely wasted notion. It doesn't exist as far as we know it in this world. No mathematicians or philosophers can prove that. But excellence is a much more, um, much more messy notion and um, much more power in there. He argues that work of excellence can be transformational. So a lot of our children are doing good work, either because they like us, they want to please their parents, or they want to get good grades. Nothing wrong with any of those, but those are extrinsic. And what Berger argues is that really, really, really high quality work, if I produce that, I'm not going to lower my standards again, because I know what I can do, all right? Really deep intrinsic stuff. And that's um, articulated very well by Austin's Butterfly, which I'm not going to show because I'm sure a lot of you have seen it. If, if you haven't, it's worth spending seven minutes of your life just having a look at that. So much power in there. But if we're talking about high challenge, low threat, and children doing demanding things, a six-year-old starts off with the top left. Right. After another five iterations, it ends up, not, it's not a piece of artwork, it's a piece of uh, scientific reproduction of a, of a, um, of a biological um, drawing of a swallowtail but butterfly. Interestingly, the third one goes backwards when you start unpicking it and analyzing it. That is progress. That's what progress looks like. Sometimes it goes backwards. Sometimes it's consolidation. Now, to my shame, I'd have accepted that first one. Because it's not bad for a five, six-year-old. Interestingly, when I talked to primary colleagues about it, they said, yeah, we'd have done that too, because it's not bad. Great, makes me feel a bit better. But then they said, and then the next five lessons, we'd have done exactly the same stuff with different, you know, just different things that they'd be drawing all of the same quality, right? when the child was capable of that. So I think we've got to think very hard about what we're doing when we're racing through a curriculum. We might have got it covered on a piece of paper or a spreadsheet. Have our children really got it to that quality? What's happening there is that child is developing the deep internal architecture of what high quality work looks like. And it then means it's going to be much more efficient when it goes on to do something else very demanding as well. Given that we can't cover everything, what is it that we're going to say, this is absolutely a non-negotiable, non we're going to do this in sufficient depth? Um, I'm talking a lot about ORIS at the moment as a way of putting high extra challenge in to our lessons. I think it's very interesting that of the, of the four <coughs> elements in the national curriculum which relate to English, writing is number four. Now, I've got nothing against writing. I just wonder why we privilege writing above speaking, listening, and reading. Because it's hard, it's easy, it's easy to mark. That's basically what we do. But if we want to, if we want to raise standards everywhere, including the quality of writing, we will pay much more attention, I'm arguing, to the quality of the spoken word in the classroom. Um, it's James Britton who said that writing floats on a sea of chalk in the early 70s. Um, it's particularly important for those pupils who 
if any of you are Alex Quigley's um, session this morning, and the, 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 the research is out there, it's long standing, that the children who come from poorer backgrounds, poorer backgrounds financially, have heard up to 30 million words fewer than those who've not. Got to be very careful that we're not stereotypical about these children. I'm sure you can think of children who um, have pupil premium funding, who are disadvantaged, and yet have everything they need. Stories, poems, songs, grandparents taking them down to the allotment or down the riverbank. You've got children who, have, who are financially poor, but otherwise they are rich. No fun not having money, but they are okay. And you'll also have children who have got all the money in the world, but they've got that pinched look, because no one's listened to them. No one's really heard what they say. But that aside, as a cohort, standards for these children in England <coughs> decline the longer they are with us. Now, I, as an educator, cannot do anything about wider society and the fact these children, by and large, are not getting a language-rich diet. There's nothing I can do about that. However, the minute they cross the threshold to my setting, the minute they come into my classroom, I'm going to be absolutely focused on making sure that there is a language, a high-powered aspiration and expectation that every child has an entitlement to and contributes to, because this is a matter of, in my view, it's a matter of, it's a matter of social justice. One of the ways to do this is to start thinking about questions. Now, my concern about the questions and getting to the depth and getting to the challenge is, um, there we are, is, um, is, is, the, is they're quite often uh, separated into uh, good questions and bad questions. So open questions are good, higher order questions are good, and uh, closed questions and low order questions are not so good. I think we've got to strip all that out. Questions are important, full stop. How can I evaluate and analyse and, and think of new things if I haven't got any knowledge? So I think we've got to strip this out. And I, um, I know what Bloom was doing with this taxonomy, but I think it should be a flat structure, in my opinion. However, when we're looking about trying to get some questions, um, trying to use these to get some greater depth, what we need to be thinking about is if I'm asking how many characters there are in the story, how many... Uh, can we tell the story in our own words? I'm going to get very similar products as a teacher from my class. Very similar. If I'm checking them, they're going to be quite similar. Nothing wrong with that. However, when I start asking, what would happen if Goldilocks came to your house? Which bit of the story did you like best? Can you think of a different ending to the story? The child is going to be drawing on a much wider and uh, richer range of experience and imagination to answer those, which is good. But I, as a teacher, have got much greater insight into the extent to which that child has understood the story, rather than just telling me how many characters there were and they telling it in their own words. I think that those sorts of questions only take us so far. We need them, but they only take us so far. I just want to spend a bit now on uh, etymology. Am I standing in the wrong bit that it keeps jumping? Is it something I'm doing? Uh, is there a techie person? No, I've just texted you. You just texted. Okay, I'm going to bang on about etymology anyway. I can do that. So, <laughs> we've got. <laughs> We've got children at the age of four who are um, fluent in dinosaurs. <laughs> Tyrannosaurus rex. A lot of our four-year-olds know also that dinosaur comes from the Greek for scary lizard. Enos is scary, Saurus is a lizard. If they can do it at four and take a great interest in playing with the language, why are we dumbing so much stuff? Down. Why are we watering things down by thinking our children can't cope? They can cope. Right? And what happens paradoxically is it gives them a greater purchase. It gives them a bigger basket into which to put their thinking. So I was arguing just now that we should be doing our planning around big concepts and big ideas. If we link it to, to etymology we can start both making things more efficient and opening them out as well. So I've got colleagues in Suffolk in <coughs> year one, <coughs> key stage one, year one, who are teaching 
some key Christian beliefs through incarnation. So for Christians, a fundamental belief is that the divine becomes human, that God becomes human in the form of baby Jesus. The children have been taught what the root meaning of that word is. In means in, that's easy. Calm, the calm bit, comes from the Latin for flesh. And that's where we get carnival, chili con carne, carnation. Um, and so they're able to talk about the fact that an important thing for Christians is that God became human and it's called incarnation. That starts sorting out all the twee trite stuff around Christmas. Yeah? Nothing wrong with all the Christmas stuff, but let's put it in the bucket when we're doing our re of the notion of incarnation. Similarly with salvation. I haven't yet worked out. They've got, they know that salvation comes from the Latin for to save. And again, that holds everything around Easter, uh, apart from the Easter Bunny. I don't know how these funny work. <laughs> but the rest of it does. The eggs and all the rest of it do, and the new life do, are all linked to that notion of salvation. So it both makes it more efficient, but it also puts greater depth there when we start really thinking through one of the key concepts, and then I'm arguing it gives it greater power when we start doing some etymology. Similarly, in maths, if I know that isosceles comes from the Greek, from isos, meaning equal, skeles meaning legs, right? I've got a much clearer picture in my mind of actually what an isosceles triangle is. Furthermore, when I meet isos again, as in isobar, isometric, I might have a clue that it's something to do with equal. So it's this playfulness for the language which is providing greater depth and more challenge. What I'm finding is, is that children can't wait to go off and do the research around this. Right? I do not need to be a classicist in order to deliver it. I just, oh, that's an interesting word. I wonder where that came from. Which is exactly what happened to me when I was talking about it. I was then asked, what, um, what's the etymology? What's the root for area, Mary? Fortunately, I had just Googled it. Because <laughs> he was on the papier and I was on that. And um, it means an empty space. I find that deeply satisfying, that the area is an empty space. It's inside all that stuff. And you can start into primitive and all the rest of it. So um, when we start doing that, we're giving our children the tools in order to enter into the academic discourse of that domain, which is important in and of itself, but it's also important um, for their future. You know, if they want to go on and study it, you certainly need for GCSEs and A-levels, etc. So when you're thinking about what good work looks like, can you want to know what good work looks A minute. Oh, 15 minutes. Oh, great. I completely lost track of time. Ten. That's okay. I can do this in ten. Great. <laughs> I do these places that don't have clocks in them. I don't think people go. I have got my phone here, but I've got no. I've got more time in. Okay, I can do this in more than ten minutes. So, um, thinking about what does good work look like, linking it very strongly to the curriculum. Some schools are working on the knowledge organisers, which I've got. Think have got some real potential. Um, hearing Alex Quigley this morning, he's saying that knowledge organisers only take so far. I suspect he's right. But I think what's interesting in this example of a year seven um, unit on apartheid, um, what they've done is they've distilled the key knowledge that those children need to know inside out, back to front and upside down in order to be able to access it. From my point of view, okay, setting five or six of those for homework on a regular basis, knowing that they can spell them, tell me what they mean and also where the roots are, I'm saving myself a huge amount of time as a teacher, which is not the main point. I'm putting some real pressure on them in order to be able to uh, put some access on it. This is much richer than having piles of worksheets. Right? I remain to be convinced on the utility of worksheets. I think I really worry when they get stuck into exercise books and we're in Hebrew school, but that's another story. Um, but um, an awful lot of them are putting, are, are constraining the learning, they're putting limits on children's learning, um, and we are quite often, when we're setting different <coughs> worksheets, particularly for the low, middle, and high priority in children, we're putting, we're putting a ceiling on what they could do. It's also extremely time consuming. So let's be thinking far more about some coherent products in the way that Austin's Butterfly was a coherent product. And I've just got a quick example here, which has come out of the Swiss. Cottage Special School in London, 
Um, and when the curriculum uh, was revised in 2013 and levels were taken away, 10 schools were given 10,000 quid each in order to come up with some curriculum models of which Swiss Cottage School was one. I use this in every context because high quality thinking about uh, curriculum design and provision and what good work looks like applies from early years up to key stage five and into FE. It's just we're looking at different products as they come out of it. So whether you've got an SEM background or not, I think this applies to all of us. So in this context, it's the allegory of the guitar, and it's about thinking about how to introduce meaningful assessment without levels for learners with complex needs. The bit <coughs> I'm not just thinking about though in this is whether there's high challenge in here or not. So learner A and learner B, who were um, volunteers, uh, wanted to become musicians. Learner A was given a 12-page list of outcomes which were related in some way to playing the guitar. Teacher A ticked each outcome off upon being met one by one. Identifies the colour of the guitar. Quite what that's got to do with playing with it, Ben. We'll let that go. <clears throat> Counts the strings of the guitar. Blacks the strings of the guitar. No guitar Learner A had met most of the outcomes on the first eight pages of the list. And on occasions, Teacher A would happily use the list to show the impact of her lessons and how successfully Learner A had reached higher levels. And after several years, the visitor walked into the classroom and asked Learner A to play the guitar. The, learner, the visitor was promptly told by everyone in the room that this was not possible, as playing the guitar was something that Learner A had never interpreted before. The visitor then looked through the 12 page list of outcomes, and by this time, all, most all of them had been ticked. Teacher explained that this was because Learner A had met them. And he's now working at a higher level, she proudly said to the visitor. The visitor then proceeded to ask Leonard A questions related to the very first outcome, which had been ticked some time ago. What colour is your guitar, my friend? And Leonard A was not able to answer. Meanwhile, with teacher B, Leonard B was set to the learning intention, I will perform in front of a live audience. And the first time Learner B tried to do this, he nervously shook a tambourine and sung alongside Teacher B, who played the guitar. He then learned to join in by slowly strumming a guitar with support from one of his friends. And over yet several years, he learned some simple chords and tunes and became more comfortable with bigger and less familiar audiences. Each term, his learning intention was adjusted to enable greater mastery. And after several years, the visitor walked into the classroom to the sound of Learner B rehearsing his own guitar composition using two to three chords, making only a few technical errors. Isn't this beautiful? He smiled and turned to teach B music to my ears. So if we had more time, I'd be unpacking what might have been going on there in terms of curriculum design and, cur and thinking about the design. But as we're short of time, I'm going to tell you what my version is of it. So i not you've got to be careful not to be judgmental. I've just got to say, what is the impact on learning and what might have, um, have more power behind it? I suspect there was some learner A, pra teacher A practice sitting behind teacher B. However, teacher B was thinking about something really demanding for that child to do over time. We could argue that learner B showed mastery in a way that learner A didn't. <coughs> but the proxy for learning, which was all those tick sheets and all the, all the exercises he had done, looked as though it was there. Now, the paradox of mastery is that once I am in the territory of mastery, I realise how little I know. So that child, learner B, in front of a live audience, is going to be knows and he's going to grow. And the paradox is with learner B, learner A does not know what he doesn't know and has never been, has never been entered into the place of mastery of high challenge and low threat. Oh, great, lovely, thank you. And we're nearly done today. That's okay. And then, um, I think I've nearly finished anyway. I can't remember what I was going to say. Oh, yes, yeah, so let's think about some coherent products. Great, next one. <laughs> I'll just say yeah, that. <laughs> so, we've talked about Austin's Butterfly. We just want to revisit the headlines of that. We think of high challenge, low threat. If we think of learner A and learner B, we need a fundamental, subtle shift in our thinking about curriculum design. And when we've got some of that, and it doesn't need to be perfect, because perfection doesn't exist, um, it, it, it not only has huge benefits for our pupils and students, it saves us time. Okay, think about what low challenge. Can we remember as we do this what our children <coughs> say? They want demanding work, please. 
And can we also remember, as we work through everything that's going on in education, that we're human beings first, that we're professionals second. And if you'd like to continue the conversation, that's me on the Twitter. Bless you. Thank you for listening.